Can I just thank the organizers, particularly obviously John and Anne, and uh, also Chris and many others working in the sort of uh, behind the scenes to make things work properly. It's really good to be with you here and uh, I've really appreciated coming to the conference. I've learned a lot myself today about seahorses and about spiders' webs. I hadn't known that about water droplets that Diane brought out. Some great things that uh, have been uh, presented here. The talk that I'm about to do, I think John's just announced this, but just I'll say it again. The DVD of it is a, a modern version of a talk that I put together some years ago, but this is an updated version and it's all on the uh, DVD store just outside there. Intricacies of Flight, I think we're selling it for 15, is it? I can't remember. $15, yeah. Then there's the one on the Bombardier Beetle, which I'll be doing a bit later. The one on the Wonder of Hearing, which I'm also doing a bit later. These will be available um, during, uh, I suppose, immediately after this talk for a while, little while, but certainly available if you're coming tomorrow. Let's dive into this then. And I want to ask the question concerning flight. So how do you produce, evolve a sophisticated flying machine? Is it evolutionary magic or is it brilliant engineering? And you know where I'm going with that question. Many people have thought that all you have to do with just flight was just to add a lot of uh, feathers onto your arms and you would get it right. I'm afraid this, fa this fella found to his cost that uh, that didn't work. It's not just a matter of growing feathers. Neither is it a matter of building, in this case, a lighter than air machine which of course could be a way of doing it, but that, from my point of view, is cheating when we're considering heavier than air flight. It was the French who did that first. Um, <laughs> nothing against the French, of course, that was quite ingenious, but that's not taking the principle which we want, which is getting a heavier than aircraft being able to fly. And we're going to see, as we go through this, that it's not a matter of just throwing everything together. You have a principle in living systems, and it's true for all engineering devices. If you're involved in designing something, as we were told earlier, it involves intelligence, we hope, particularly with man-made things, you sometimes wonder, particularly when it comes to windows and other stuff. By the way, I've been converted twice. I was converted in 1969 to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And a little over a year ago, I was converted from the uh, old-fashioned Dell, whatever they call them, Windows-based machines to a Mac. And uh, I should have done it years ago, but there we go. So I'm really convinced these are much better, more robust stuff. So anyway, whatever you're doing with design, you've got, it's not just the individual parts, it's that they've all got to be working together as a system. You could have half the system working and it won't work. In fact, you could have 90% of the system working and it still won't work. You've got to have everything working together. We call that irreducible complexity. The Wright brothers were the first people to fly in terms of controlled flight. Richard Pierce, not far away from here, over the Tasman Sea, actually did fly, uh, but and just before the Wright brothers, but it wasn't really a controlled flight. So I know the New Zealanders do take a little bit of an objection to the Wright brothers taking the biscuit, but the Wright brothers did actually do it in a very controlled way. Okay, they did have an accident by the end of the day, and the first flight, it's true, was not more than about the length and a bit of a Boeing 747, but <laughs> that's the whole length of the first flight but they really did control it by warping the wings. Blerio got into the act fairly shortly afterwards. Uh, he started flying across the channel, perhaps trying to reverse the fortunes of the Napoleonic Wars, but uh, anyway, he, he flew in not, not long afterwards, only six years, and people were building even monoplanes, which was pretty good going. There's some amazing things that we notice about uh, bird flight, things which have only recently been put, that is in the last perhaps two couple of decades now, and that's things like the curved winglets that you'll see 
at the end of aircraft, if you're looking at the uh, end of the wings of aircraft, if you're looking out of the passenger seat near the wing, you'll see that they have these winglets on. A Boeing 737 that I came over from Perth um, had winglets on. It had a big winglet going upwards. It's a Series 800 Boeing 737, and a lot of the airliners do have it. These are actually for reducing induced drag, that is drag that you always get as a result of lift, because you've got a finite wing, the induced drag is always there because you've got a trailing vortex coming behind the wing. And you could reduce that by making the wings very, very wide, but that's not uh, going to be very efficient in terms of the mass that you're also having to carry. It's okay for gliders, but if you're going at speed, then you're carrying a lot of weight. Um, so they compromise and they actually put winglets which go up and this has the effect of reducing the low speed drag, and it's at low speed this is particularly seen. A lot of the aircraft time is spent at low speed. Next time you're landing at uh, Brisbane, you'll notice that the usually, or particularly in a very busy airport, maybe somewhere like Sydney, you'll be circling quite a bit in order to get into the right path for coming in onto the runway. And there's a lot of fuel used at low speed because um, at the cruise you're not using half as much fuel per second but you're using a lot per second as you come in in a high lift condition with the flaps down. You've got all these vortices coming behind which are induced drag, right? So you're not getting anything for your buck in all these vortices going behind. So this is a means of reducing the fuel consumption, and of course birds were doing it a long time before, and it, it took us a long while to catch up. It took us virtually 80 years before we realized, hey, there's a little trick here that we could do. And um, the, uh, the, the birds had it already, and guess who had designed them with that wonderful feature? And it's uh, those features which are on a number of raptors in particular. Put this back. Sorry number of raptors, but here's an example with an owl. You can see the winglets here, um, which are an example of that. By the way, owls, as we're passing them, have another feature, which is really quite remarkable. They have, if you look very closely at the feathers on an owl, they have serrated edges to their, to their feathers. Each one of those feathers on all the birds, by the way, can be controlled individually. Each feather can be twisted, right? That's true of any bird, right? But these owls have specially serrated edges which reduces the noise of the individual feathers. The owl is the quietest bird and, of course, um, it, it does everything by hearing, by the way. It's listening out with very, very sensitive ears, which are specially placed. I'll talk about that when I do my talk on hearing. And it's able to pinpoint with great accuracy where the rodent is, and it does everything by hearing. And it knows where the creature is, and it brings its talons down. It's not looking when it comes down onto its prey. And it's keeping itself quiet by those specially designed feathers. Another aspect about the feathers of all birds, they have a special little bit called the Alula feathers. The Alula feathers act like a leading edge device. A lot of aircraft these days, you'll see it as they're coming in to land again, if you look at the wings as the aircraft's coming in. He puts the flaps down at the back, much cruder than what a bird does, which is actually to change the camber of the wing at the back. But he also puts forward flaps down. And the forward flaps are very important because what happens then is that the air from underneath is actually switched. Instead of going underneath, some of it's going to be pushed going on top. That's very important because you have what's called a boundary layer going over the top of the wing. And at low speed, the danger is that you will stall. Okay? You can have the aerofoil, which is what this is really on a bird, at very high angle of attack, but the air will separate from the top if it's 
uh, going too slowly. So you re-energize that by having a forward slat or a forward flap, which pushes more air to go through the top. Even a tiny little morning warbler or a robin, an English robin, very small bird, will actually have these Alula feathers, which are again for low speed. Other things that we notice in the aerodynamic excellence of birds are some of the birds that I'd love to see, but we don't have them in the Northern Hemisphere, um, are the albatross, which you'll find, of course, it was, uh, you'll find these in Tasmania, in a wonderful example of places where you can find these albatross. And uh, the wandering albatross is absolutely superb flyer and really is a glider. And it's got very, very wide wings. And one flapping motion on an albatross will take it roughly 22 meters, right? And it hardly needs to flap its wings at all. In fact, it can spend months on the wing before it comes back again to, to land. Wandering albatross also use the updraft from the waves in order to get extra lift. And they do a superb movement, which I could do a whole lecture on, because glider pilots know about this, that if you actually circle into the wind, you gradually gain height. And you can see albatross doing that over the southern oceans. But as I've said, all birds have sophisticated maneuverability due to the fact that they can change the shape of their wings. No designer of aircraft does that today. We do have ornithopters, which is probably the closest to that, but they, they've never really, uh, quotes, taken off, unquote. But, uh, they, uh, but you, the birds have this capacity to change the shape of their wings almost in a moment. Is that evolutionary magic or is it brilliant engineering? Theodore von Kármán, whom you won't know, but those of us involved in aeronautics will have heard of him because of the Kármán Vortex Street, which I'm showing at the top there, um, it, which causes the noise from telegraph wires whilst the wind is blowing. Um, he said this, scientists study the world as it is, engineers create the world that never has been. In other words, an engineer knows how to take the principle of something and make it into something that nobody had ever thought of, or an application that had never been thought of. So that's true here of all these flyers that I'm talking about in nature. Here's a, the male American kestrel, which is a little bit more colorful than its European counterpart, but it's got some a wonderful example here of the Alula feather, and here's another one, which is the red-tailed hawk in England, again showing these Alula feathers. Talking about kestrels, let me just talk briefly about hovering. Kestrels, when you see a kestrel, it's a small bird of prey, it's not a large one, but they'll, sometimes you'll see them fluttering. I don't know whether you have them so much in Australia. We certainly have them in Europe and uh, as I've indicated in America, but they flutter. Now, how, why are they, they're stationary, but their wings are fluttering. And what's happening is this, they're flicking the edges of their wings against um, the retresses, the tail feathers, which are being used as an air brake. So the tendency would be to tip up the bird, but the air brake is stopping that. And they're flicking their wings like this, and absolutely stationary, even in a 30 mile an hour headwind, they'll still just be utterly stationary with respect to the ground. Absolutely marvels with brilliant eyesight. Time won't allow me to talk to you about the eyesight of raptors, but the special features in the eyes which enable them to see things miles away, which we would need a pair of high powered binoculars in order to see. Um, but of course, the ones which really take the biscuit on, uh, I have to say, take the cookie in America, they don't understand English there. But uh, the ones which really take the biscuit are the hummingbirds. The hummingbirds have the ability to hover by a totally different principle. They are actually doing this motion with their wing tip. If this is one wing, it's actually coming from, it's really the humerus bone, the, the radius and the, hum, um, the, radius and the ulna, 
and it's really swiveling more about this joint than this joint. But um, there, so there, their hand, or the, the bones of the hand, are actually, like all birds, supporting the wing. And the alula feather is on the equivalent of the thumb bone. Uh, but this is basically rigid here, and they're doing this. The whole wing is doing this. It's a figure of eight motion, and that's what I'm seeking to indicate from this bottom diagram. So that wing is doing a figure of eight motion, and the slight variation in the figure of eight motion will actually give you a different... Um, different uh, slight movement in the bird as, as it may have a slightly different movement one side to the other. It will move sideways or it will move up, down or even backwards due to this amazing ability to swivel its wing and with it a swivel joint in the bones which only the hummingbird has. So if this creature was to have evolved it's got to evolve this special swivel joint, as well as the other features of a hummingbird, which are things like the ability to use the nectar, which it gets from plants, and with a high metabolic rate, all these things have to be right for this creature to be able to survive. They are wonders to behold. Can we have the sound, please, Chris? Make sure the sound is there. Should be, should be going now. No sound. Okay, maybe it's not up here. It is up here. You got it now? No sound. Oh dear. Maybe it's me. Maybe it's ah, uh, it's me. It's my end. I just seen what the problem is. Forgive me, I didn't check this and I should have done. Sound is not coming out through the headphone jack, that's the reason. It should be now. There we go. So you get this wonderful sound, as you all will have known if you've visited places where they have hummingbirds. I guess you do have them up here in Queensland in places, do you? Or do they not get down here? I'm not sure whether they do. No, they're only found in the Americas. Yeah. Say again. Okay, you have, this, yeah, you have a different creature. But um, these hummingbirds are marvels of basically aerobatics. And you can see here from this fast photography the twisting motion of this blue-throated hummingbird. Varying the way that the wings are being used with this figure of eight motion will determine whether you're going forwards, slightly up, or whether you're going even backwards. And the other thing that we should notice about hummingbirds is that they're actually playing around because they're such small birds and they're beating their wings so fast that they're actually playing around with the very vortices that I was mentioning earlier that all wings produce. So because their wings are beating so fast, there is actually a ring of vorticity. And for them, flying through the air because they're so small is like flying through custard. Okay, And that's the same for insects. They are feeling the air, they're feeling the vorticity. Or perhaps a better analogy would be flying through water. They're feeling the viscosity of the air and they're feeling the vorticity and manipulating the vorticity. That's what, actually what's going on. We didn't manage to get these DVDs because uh, we had to make a decision as to how much we were going to actually in this country because this but, is how um, they get their suit. This DVD oh. is available on the Answers in Genesis website and Stuart Burgess, myself, David Menton, Ken Ham, Bodie Hodge and others are on it and, and it's a, it a lovely DVD remember. produced by 21 year old absolute brilliant uh, so film director who produced that. But one other thing about the hummingbird is that it has a tongue. Can you just see that tongue there? I'm going to show you another bit here. Can you see the tongue pushing out here? has this long tongue. If that hummingbird didn't have the long tongue and didn't have the long beak, that would be the end of any evolutionary experiment. You might have it have the ability to hover, but all what would happen, it would just wouldn't be able to get anything, would it? even if you had the plant ready with the nectar. But supposedly, supposing an evolutionary experiment which had produced the beak and the tongue, right, 
and everything was ready, but it hadn't got the ability to hover, hadn't got that special swivel joint. It would come in at 30 miles an hour, go straight through the other side, and that was the end of that evolutionary experiment. Apart from the fact that you've got to evolve a feather. Oh, by the way, that is actually a very complicated device. A feather is a marvel of lightweight engineering. Let's just have a look at feathers. You can't just put a feather anywhere. You can't just put a tertiary feather out here. You can't put a secondary feather up there. If you put a cross section against a wing, you've got an aerofoil shape. Now, if you know anything about aer aeronautics, an aerofoil is a very complicated shape. And yet, this is being built by natural growing of feathers in the right place, in cross section, such that you'll get an aerofoil shape which means that as this wing is going even straight into the air, not at an angle, you still get some lift. It's the best shape for getting as much lift as you can for, one, uh, for, for the mass of the structure that you're making. So you've got, you've got covering feathers, we call them coverts, lesser coverts, medium coverts, greater coverts, the allulas I mentioned, primary coverts. These are the primary feathers. You can tell a primary feather, this came from a buzzard, by the fact that it's incredibly asymmetric. Okay? When you get more symmetric feathers, then it becomes secondary and tertiary, it is almost symmetric. So every feather's got to be put in the right place. Even a little hummingbird's got about a thousand, maybe ten thousand feathers. And they're all just in the right position. Now, when you look at a feather under a microscope, it's made um, of keratin, but when you look under the microscope, it's very different to a scale, and yet people try to make out that feathers came from scales. But not only is the material slightly different, but we'll give them that, it's actually a slightly different form of keratin. The keratin that I used to have in this stuff, do you remember, you know, have you seen pictures of me? I did have some hair in the original video of this talk. But, uh, but keratin is essentially the hair and the fingernails uh, which are made from that keratin. But now when you look more closely, it's nothing like a scale. A scale doesn't grow from the same position in the creature. Let me explain briefly where, the feather, where a feather grows from. A feather grows from a follicle. And the follicle grows from a special location just under the skin. It's nothing like what a scale looks like. This is the little diagram of a follicle with a feather cylinder inside, and there's a special growth collar at the bottom. This is what you actually see under the microscope. You can see here the feather cylinder, the sheath, and this growth collar. This little video will actually show you now a feather, obviously speeded up, which grows in this sheath and then spreads out ahead at the top of the sheath. And the sheath is just made of what really looks like a big biro, right? If you take, the, take this bit out, it's a bit like that. And this crumbles away as the feather grows up round it. It's really quite a remarkable, dare I say it, design. Here is my wife holding the wing of a, a pigeon that we called Humpty. The reason was because it fell out of a tree. And uh, we tried to feed it. We hadn't understood that you needed to feed it on sugar solution. Sadly, the creature died. But you can see here the little keratin sheaths of these beautiful feathers growing for the first time out of this fledgling. Actually, every time it molts, Every time a bird molts, it grows from the keratin sheath. But the feather itself is held together at the microscope level, the micro, uh, micro level, by a series of barbules coming out from the barb. The barb is this bit, right? Have you ever asked the question why a feather hangs together? How do the barbs stay together? Well, the barbs stay together because on every adjacent barb between them is a series of barbules, the vertical ones of which I'm looking at there have hooks on, and the horizontal ones of which have ridges on, okay? 
So you've got a curtain rail effect. You've got ridges sliding, sorry, hooks sliding over ridges. This is a natural picture that David Menton took some years ago of the hooks sliding over the ridges. So just a minute. According to evolution, there is no mind behind this. So you've, you've got to say that it so happened that all the ones going in that direction had hooks on and all the ones going in the other direction had ridges on. Get a life. That's not science, that's wishful thinking. Clearly this is showing to any engineer that this is clever design work. And anyway, if you've got a sliding joint, what do you need? Every engineer knows that if you're rubbing something against another, you need lubrication. Where does a bird get its lubrication from? And let me ask the question again, is this evolutionary magic or is it brilliant engineering? You know where a bird gets its uh, oil from. It's not being rude when it does this. It's actually getting it from a gland right at the base of its spine. And this bird, therefore, this is obviously a white uh, pelican in this case, but it's true for every bird. It's got to have the ability, you try it now, to turn its head 180 degrees. You can barely turn it, some of you, 20 degrees, right? And it's got to have the ability to put its beak, the equivalent to my nose, right? You can't do it, can you? You can't do it. Not even the young people here can do it. You cannot bend your neck. It's not designed to do that. So a bird, in order to have evolved, any bird has got to have the ability to turn its head 180 degrees. It's got to have the preening gland. It's got to have feather structure along the lines of what I've just been saying. To suggest that this evolved from the scales of reptiles is frankly not science. It is simply wishful thinking. Even if we were to accept the millions of years, which I don't, uh, and look at the fossil record, you actually find feathers in hardened resin, which we call amber, supposedly 25 million years ago, wouldn't accept it for a moment, but actually this is a feather trapped in the amber, it's no different to a modern feather. And even the feather of Archaeopteryx, look at it, it is obviously a secondary feather. Those of us who know a bit about birds can see that because it's not curved, but nevertheless very asymmetric, it's probably a secondary feather of an Archaeopteryx. It's really quite remarkable that when you look at these fossils, it's telling you a totally different story to what the evolutionist says. Some of the feathers, of course, are made for beauty. When people try to argue as, um, you know, that somehow that there is a, a sexual advantage in the male putting up this massive show of feathers. Just a minute, the peahens actually on the whole are not that really interested in this massive display. I talked with somebody who knows about peahens and peacocks that sometimes the peahens get so bored they go around behind the peacock and pluck at the feathers behind and say, come on, get a life, I'm not interested in you. As if to say, the, the, the peacock feather appears to have been designed much more for us to regard its beauty and to the glory of God. The a wonder of the peacock eye is that it actually has iridescent colors combined with pigment, uh, pigment colors, I should have said. It has iridescent colors as well as, um, um, what did I say? Um, uh, as, as, lo as well as um, um, pigment colors. So the pigment colors grow at a particular rate following the particular barb. But what is very interesting is that the iridescent colors are all to do with very complicated physics, to do with the bouncing of the light from the surface. And if that surface is at slightly different position or has a slightly different thickness in the transparent material, then you get an odd effect which is changing the wavelength and gives you the impression of this shimmering green and shimmering blue. Now, just a minute, you've got this eye and the eye is still going to be keeping its shape as the barbs in the feather grow. 
So you've got here a very complicated picture, as it were. (coughs) You've got a picture which has got to maintain its original shape, even as feathers which are growing through that picture are changing in order to make sure that those colors are maintained. That is just blows your mind. So looking at a peacock feather, or peacock eye, I should say, there are some interesting points. It looks beautiful. Shall I say why that I think it looks beautiful? We've got this golden ratio occurring, which was mentioned earlier. This this ratio here is 1.618. So there is a playing around with some lovely ratios here, which are attractive to the human eye. People say that feathers grew from pre-existing creatures which were gradually emerging from reptiles. So what do we do with the leoning shale fossils of creatures which we don't, some of which it is admitted that we don't have today. We don't have this particular bird. Neither do we have that bird. But may I suggest that this is probably a flightless bird, an extinct bird. And this is probably just an ordinary bird, again, that we don't have. It's interesting that when you actually go to these Chinese fossils where the argument is made that they're they're showing evidence of reptile changes into birds, um, you find fish as well. And many of the furry type stuff that they also find on some of the creatures that we don't have today may well not be flying uh, examples at all. They may well actually be due be other creatures, water-based creatures, maybe something like a beaver um, surface, such that really the whole evidence is being interpreted through and forced through the, uh, the lens of evolution when really it doesn't have to be. If you just let the evidence speak for itself, it's actually suggesting that really you've just simply got extinct creatures that we don't have today. Let me just say one or two words about the, uh, the bone structure of birds. Birds have, in the main, hollow bones. Next time that you um, have a bird on a special occasion, like a chicken or a turkey or a duck or whatever, and you're, you've got it on the meal table, obviously we put the bird on its back, it's dead, I hope, and you cut it against the breastbone, Right? And you're cutting against this keeled sternum. And you're actually cut through two muscles, which I'm going to show you in a moment. But just before we leave the bone structure, you, if you were to cut one of those bones, you will notice that it has lots and lots of little cross members and tiny little cavities in it because it's built for strength but lightness. Only those diving birds, like the loon bird, or sometimes called diving birds, which we have in England, you will have some here as well. Birds like the puffin don't have that, but most other birds do have these, uh, this light structure. So bones are designed for lightness. Birds' bone structure is exceedingly light, hollow, and many of the features were copied for aircraft in the Second World War, using what's this structure, they realized that you could have something which would give strength and lightness. It's called the Warren's Truss Arrangement. Let me now come to these muscles that I mentioned are attached to that sternum bone. And this is a most interesting fact. These muscles attached to the keeled sternum are here. Let me just blow that up so that you can see it. This is looking down the sternum bone, the breastbone, okay? And this is the main supracoracoideous muscle that you use to knock against your brother when you were young and just say, I want that off you, you know? Or maybe you used it in tennis a little bit when you were a bit older, but you found it more difficult to do this movement, didn't you, in tennis? because you had to use a smaller muscle on your back here, which pulls the humerus bone, which is this, up. Now, we can't do that motion easily, but a bird does it easily. Shall I tell you for why? Because it has another muscle. And it has a muscle which threads round the 
a, a special bone, which I'll talk about in a moment, and threads to this sternum bone, the breastbone, at the front. This is the bone that it threads round, which is the scapula, which is similar to a, a shoulder bone, but it's not it, the whole the whole. The whole set of bones really is very different for a bird than for a reptile or for a, a mammal. You, won't, you don't really talk about the shoulder of a bird, but the scapula is similar to a shoulder bone. And this is the tendon of this extra muscle going round the back and now being attached to the front again of the sternum. Or uh, the ligament of it is attached to the sternum. So you've got two muscles here attached to the breastbone. So you've got the pectoralis major muscle going like that, and then you've got the supracoracoideus muscle, this extra muscle, which pulls it back up again. So you've got two muscles in tandem. And though, most interestingly, all the weight of these muscles is now here, instead of at the back, which is very useful because a bird, when it's flying, needs to have the weight near the keel which is the sternum bone, the breastbone. You can see it very well on this diagram, these two muscles. And now you can see from this film, you can see the pectoralis major. Now you can see the supracoracoideus pulling up, pectoralis major pulling down. So a bird is built for having this tandem motion of the muscles. This could not have come about by random mutations and natural selection operating on them. Everything is telling you this is sophisticated engineering. To suggest otherwise is frankly foolish. It's not science. The bone and muscle structure of birds is just utterly amazing. So when people draw diagrams like this saying that the keeled sternum of a bird evolved from some sort of reptile, uh, some reptile structure, all these ones in between are never found. All these things are just wishful thinking in the minds of the evolutionists. The Archaeopteryx, its record is meant to be different, but it's really it's just simply the same as a bird. In my view, it was just simply a bird. And it didn't have such a marked sternum, but it certainly did have a sternum nevertheless. That which perhaps really shows the difference between birds and reptiles, I'm not going to be able to do insects, by the way. I'd love to do it, but we really haven't time. If we want to have questions as well, I can't do that. But uh, I will just end on this matter of the breathing. Birds breathe in an entirely different way to other creatures. We breathe using two lungs. I hope that you've got two operating tonight. You could just manage on, uh, on one, but if you haven't got... Uh, that one, well, that's the end of you. But birds actually have a very different arrangement. By the way, if you begin to stop breathing, we can do artificial respiration on you, right? We can push against your lungs to make them draw in air or take push out air and get the system, we hope, working again. But you wouldn't be able to do anything like that with a bird. Once a bird stops breathing, here, guys, don't try and do artificial respiration on your parrot. It just won't work. And I'll tell you why. Because it's got a counterflow mass exchanger. For the engineers amongst you, you'll understand that. Let me explain. A counterflow exchanger is this. The air is always going in in the same direction and coming out in the same direction. It's a throughput of air. At the same time, the blood is coming in the other direction. So it's a counterflow system, and it's a mass exchanger. It's diffusing air from the oxygen, is diffusing into the blood there, and it's taking in carbon dioxide from the blood here. So it's actually exchanging gas with the blood as it goes along. And there's lots of these parallel tubes, whereas we have air when in our lungs, which comes to a stop. And it comes through the bronchiole, then it comes to the alveoli, not ravioli that you had tonight. But, uh, you know, it comes to a dead stop and then the air is exchanged with the blood. So this is mammal and reptile breathing. Yes, there are some who try to argue that crocodiles or uh, alligators may have a slightly different system, which is 
may be using a continuous throughput of air, but I'll show you why that just cannot have possibly been the case for any ancestral creature to birds in a moment. Because even if they did, there is another feature in bird breathing which is totally different. Let me now come to the actual way a bird breathes air in. We talked about the outside aerodynamics of birds. Let me now talk about the inside aerodynamics of birds. When a bird breathes in, the air does not immediately go to its lung. We'll do it together. Supposing this is the, uh, then we'll do it this way around. Supposing that's the, the, the trachea, the, the head of the bird here, the air initially goes to an, a rear air sac. There's loads of air sacs all around the bird. So the bird breathes in and the air goes to the rear air sac. Doesn't go into the lung. Then it breathes out and this little bit of air, right, now goes through the lung even though it's breathing out an earlier packet of air, right? Now it so we've got, we got this little bit of air here having gone through the lung. Now it breathes in again. And this, this air, this new bit of air goes to the back, but this bit of air that we're following now goes to the front air sac, ready to be breathed out. Now it breathes out again. This air goes through the lung and this air goes out of the trachea. So it's a circulatory system. All right, you with me? So the bird doesn't operate like we do. It breathes in, but the air doesn't go through the lung. Then it breathes out, goes through the lung, breathes in again, and, uh, and another packet of air comes down here, and this bit of air goes to the front air sac, and then finally it breathes out. Now here comes the million-dollar question. What drives the breathing system? Well, for you, you don't realize you're doing it. As some of you are going to sleep, how dare you during my talk? But, you know, how, how are you breathing? Well, you don't realize it, you don't feel it, but you've got a certain, what's it called? A diaphragm which is going down and slowly coming back up again. And some of you go very slow because you're going to sleep. But, you know, actually, would you, get, would you believe this? A bird does not have a diaphragm. So how does it reduce the pressure, increase the pressure in its ventricle chamber, which is really what you've got to do in order to breathe? And by the way, an alligator, which may have a continuous breathing system, it's not yet been proved, it certainly does have a diaphragm. And so do crocodiles or any reptile. All reptiles have a diaphragm. So this idea that birds could have evolved from reptiles is scotched completely. Because birds have a different system in order to operate the low pressure and the high pressure. And this is it. It's all done by a movable breastbone. They push the breastbone out and they push the breastbone in again. And in order to accommodate for that, you've got ribs on a bird. Well, the ribs would all snap if that happened. So the great designer of birds, who is the Lord himself, has made hingeable ribs, articulated ribs. So a bird has a special system in order to make sure that it can reduce the pressure, increase the pressure without a diaphragm, and actually operate just very, very efficiently. Of course, when it's flying, it's often done in sympathy with the wing beat as well. It doesn't have to be, but it's often done so. Well, we could say a huge amount more. We could talk about bird migration. We could ask the question, why do birds fly south in winter? Somebody wryly said, because it's too far to walk. But uh, there is the Arctic terns, which fly from pole to pole each year. Roughly 30 years for a, a, an Arctic tern. Do you realize that some of these birds will have flown to the moon and back four times in their lifetime? These little birds, they're not, they're not big beautiful red beaks, gorgeous birds to look at. I was in Alaska last year and I could see Arctic terns, beautiful creatures. They are at an utter marvel. The one which I think takes the biscuit is this one, which is the Pacific Golden Plover, which actually, believe, believe it or not, and I'm going to end on 
this matter of migration. The Pacific golden plover flies from Alaska and Canada and uh, you know, British Columbia and right down to California, makes the distance to Hawaii, which is about 3,000 miles, okay? But get this, the parents go first, the young have never been there before, and the young have to make the journey on their own. They've never done the journey. How do they know where to go? Somehow they've got a map in their minds, we think due to the magnetic field of the Earth, but they've also, even if you've got a map, you've got to know where to go on the map. How do they know? No wonder the Lord says, Job, are you the one who causes birds to migrate? He effectively says that in Job 38. I've paraphrased it. But that is an amazing example. The very last example is this. The bar-tailed godwit has been known to fly non-stop from Alaska to New Zealand, 7,700 miles across the Pacific for six days, over six days. That is a wonderful feat of engineering marvel. I tell you, the more you consider flight, and I've only just touched the tip of the iceberg, I'd love to talk to you about insects, which are marvels again. This shows that hasn't God done everything well. They glorify him. The invisible things of God are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power, power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Amen. Amen.